People want to hear from tier one MSOs. People want to criticize them. People want to be with them and partner with them. But people want to hear from them either way. It's the same way with politicians. It's the same way with lobbyists. It's the same with celebrities. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of The Dime. I'm Brian Fields, and with me, as always, is Kellen Finney. And this week, we've got a very special guest, Elliot Lane, VP of Events and Head of Benzinga Cannabis. Elliot, thanks for taking the time. How are you doing today? I'm having a blast already. Thanks for having me, guys. Really appreciate your time and letting me crash the party. You guys have some awesome guests, so it's honestly just an honor to be a part of it. We're excited to have you here. Kellen, how are you doing? Doing really well. Really excited to talk to Elliot and learn about Benzinga as much as we can. And uh... You know, just hanging out. How are you, Brian? I'm excited to talk to another East Coaster and Elliot for the record. Your location, please. A uh, lack of access complete with me in North Carolina. <laughs> I am in northeast part of Raleigh, where they they like Delta Eight here. So we'll we'll just put that on the back burner in your mind. And you know, in 20 years, I can buy some cannabis. <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, 20 years a lot has changed in the cannabis market. So, Elliot, for our listeners that are unfamiliar about you, can you give a little background about yourself. Yeah, so I have been working at Benzinga for about four and a half years. Uh, in that time, I started as just a regular sales guy. Um, you know, we were averaging probably about two million readers on our site back then. You know, a lot changed over COVID. Uh, to be quite frank with you, a lot of people use their stimulus money to invest and you know to look at how to grow it, and they came to our site to do that. And COVID was a bit of an indirect boon. Uh, in in our growth, the meme stock phase was a huge benefit to us. The crypto boom was a huge benefit to us and our readership. Uh, and we ended up, I think, topping out at about twenty five million readers uh, in mid uh, in I think in May twenty twenty. So we exploded at the start of COVID. We've obviously come back down to about around about like twelve to fourteen million uh, average monthly readers. Um, so that's a little bit about the backbone of Benzinga. Prior to that, I was a professional actor um, uh, on the musical theater uh, circuit, uh, if you will, on the East Coast. So that was a lot of fun. But you know, when you do contract work, it's obviously quite unpredictable. So eventually, I ended up working for Benzinga. Really enjoyed talking to cannabis companies. Really enjoyed learning about new markets. I love to learn things. And I knew literally nothing about the economy, about stock markets, about cannabis, about psychedelics, about crypto, none of it before I started Benzinga. So it was all trial by fire and uh, one that was excited to take over. So I grew in Benzinga and ended up taking over the events vertical. And now as of this year, I'm the head of uh, really all B2B activations within cannabis and psychedelics for us. I love it. So what year was it you first got started in cannabis for Benzinga? October 1st, 2018. 2018. So what type of education kind of hits you when you have to get started headfirst into an industry you've never experienced before, where you've got to talk to some of the bigger companies and learn the space fast? How how do you do that? Well, first of all, you don't know who's big and who's not. right? So one of my first calls was with Truly. And I was like, this is the same person as you know, that consultant I just talked to. Like, to me, like, there is no difference. Like, I had to learn you know, really what vendors do in the space versus plant touching companies versus payments companies versus what an ERP is. Uh, You know, you have to learn all these different slogans and it takes a while. But really what you do is you learn what you do first and what value you provide uh, and then how you fit into the space and everything just kind of trickles down from there. I think that's really well said. And Benzinga as a whole isn't just cannabis, right? Let's let, We should start from a macro mm-hmm. standpoint of Benzinga and then we can narrow down specifically on the focus of what it does for cannabis. Benzinga, we cover all markets. You know, as I mentioned, we cover crypto and, you know, stock education. We have a data platform called Benzinga Pro. If you invest in the stock market, uh, we provide a trading technology, basically suite of APIs where you can subscribe to that monthly, get really, really quick and up-to-date alerts through these APIs. You can obviously choose your own watch lists. I have about 20 different industry-focused watch lists that I have on my pro account. But it's very, very quick. So that's kind of the the more consumer, customer, retail investor facing side of it. Uh, But our our news covers everything. Uh, We cover Elon Musk very regularly, uh, you know, to our detriment and his probably, uh, we cover President Biden, you know, and, you know, we will cover a lot on uh, the report that came out this morning. 
Uh, you can probably go on Benzinga and see that on the homepage. Cannabis and fintech are really the two pillars uh, of you know market-wise, if you want to look at specific markets of what we covered. But when you think about how Benzinga became competitive, it was our willingness to cover markets that our larger peers wouldn't or didn't care to yet. So you think about Insider, you think about Bloomberg, Reuters, uh, Yahoo Finance. We are much larger into the space because of our willingness to cover it at a very high level and a very deep level. And that happened in cannabis, happened in fintech, it's happening in psychedelics. Uh, and, and we are still, I think, the leader in financial coverage for the cannabis space. And that, of course, you know, affects how much people have trust in you for the other industries as well. Why do you think that some of the bigger entities just chose not to even dive into cannabis at all? I didn't well, I mean, I think it's a mix that they didn't need to. <laughs> um, you know, when you're a, a young company, right? You you have to figure out ways to compete. You have to do yeah. things that are a little bit taboo uh, or unique or fun or creative, right? You can't just be another Bloomberg because you're not going to beat Bloomberg at Bloomberg's game. No, but you know, so Jason, if you have any sense of our company, Jason Rasnick is our CEO. He is as scrappy of a human being as he can get. And I use that word uh, intentionally because it's his favorite word um, to use. But it, he started out of his parents' basement. Our first customer, this is long before me, was TD Ameritrade uh, to use our news. And I think he called them like nine different times it, as different people to get in front of them. So he like called them as a woman one time. He called him as like different people until they finally listened to him. And they're like, okay, fine, let's take a meeting. Um, so, I mean, that's the type of personality that Jason brought to us. And it's doing things differently. It's doing things on a more um, consumer and customer friendly level where anybody that emails us, I can guarantee you 99.9% .9 we're going to respond. I think there's like a relentlessness when you operate in cannabis, you have to be scrappy. And I think that story by Jason kind of sums up perfectly that even though people forget sometimes that Benzinga is big, but they still have to play these different challenges because the, the massive entities they're fighting, Bloomberg, Reuters, Yahoo Finance, all of those other entities don't necessarily have to challenge them because they stick to their own domain. And I think people kind of forget that even though Benzinga is large, their competing tasks are still in the same restrictions that cannabis face that the other industry operators face as well. Absolutely. I mean, we, you know, <laughs> advertising our cannabis event is a massive challenge. Right? <laughs> like we, we can't do it in the same channels as like a, an electric vehicle event, uh, or an auto event or, or anything of that nature. So we do face those challenges. I think, you know, saying Benzing is large, we don't operate under that assumption. You know, we, we very much feel like a startup still, you know, and, and we obviously have a corporate structure that we have to work as because that's what you have to do to mature and, and get larger and become a competitor. But you know, we don't assume we are there yet. And I think that's why we continue to grow is because we continue to innovate and we continue to work with people that push us to innovate. So speaking on the conference, I'm excited to kind of dive into that. When setting up a location, are there other restrictions that surprise people or surprise yourself when you're trying to book, quote unquote, a cannabis conference at one of these hotels? Yeah, I will. It helps also with who we are, right? We're not a consumer yeah. event, you know, so it, it does. And I think events in the cannabis space are all lumped into this term cannabis events, right? I mean, it, it seems obvious, but it must be said, we're a very different event from a Canacon. We're a very yes. different event from a Hall of Flowers, right? We're, we're not the same really at all with the scent, with, with the one possible caveat of maybe we want a crossover with the operators, right? You know, so I mean, that that is probably as similar as we get, but we work with a lot of these events as well. MJ Biz is one of our largest partners. Um, you know, we work with Lyft. We work with uh, ArcView on a regular basis. We work with all of our, our peers and competitors in ways that people, it would probably surprise people. You know, we want to be partners to the cannabis space at large. But when putting on an event, to get back to your question, you know, it, it's... It's more about the networking uh, and, and what and the value we can provide with the amount of business cards and connections you make there. That's what we're worried about. So that's why we do everything we can to avoid holding it in a convention center. We want people to be at the hotel, to stay at the hotel. We want it to be literally 48, 72, however long hours it is of just nonstop networking. From breakfast, you go down, you, you're standing by... Uh, the CEO of a tier three MSO, uh, or you know, next to you is the the managing partner of of cannabis for Markham, 
right? You know, so I mean, these that's the networking that I get excited for is creating that really intimate way of having a large event in a space that that is not overly large. You're basically confining it to a space, but you still have 3,000 high-level executives that you can network with. Does the like state location factor in significantly in terms of like if uh, they have a medical market or adult use market? We don't... Yeah, we won't operate an event, I would say, in a market that doesn't make sense. Like they're not going to... You know, as much as I push for it, they're not going to come to, to North Carolina. I was to just going <laughs> hey, Come on, Jason. Um, I was gonna say, so Raleigh? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you guys want to get together in Raleigh, we can do a little mini uh, satellite event. I'm happy to host. Um, <laughs> but with that being said, like Miami, it, it's, it's a little bit about where will people travel? It, it's a little bit about, you know, where is our audience? You know, and when you think of the value we're trying to provide at Benzinga, you know, is access to capital, access to partnerships that could a lot in M and A deals. Uh, it could be debt capital. Uh, it could be a brand. It meets an MSO at, at our event, and you know, they're all of a sudden in their footprint. You know, those are the kinds of, of business deals that we want done at, at our event, and it happens at every event. And I think that's really cool. But when you think about our audience. We started it by investor presentations and having uh, hundreds of investors show up. So I would say probably about 25 to 30% of our audience are institutional and accredited investors. And granted, a lot of them are the original ones and the OGs that you all could probably list <laughs> yourselves. Uh, but those are very important, I think, to have there. It, you should never take for granted the experience of of those who have invested in cannabis because they are, uh, I, I think, some of the most valuable opinions you can have about where we can take this next. But that being said, we'll still have like a network of family offices. We'll have uh, people who you know recently retired and they want to put some of their wealth into cannabis companies. I mean, it's a vast array of investors. So when we think about where they are, it's generally on the East Coast. Uh, and that's why we don't really do California events. There's really nothing to do with the California market. I would be thrilled to go to San Diego or, or Los Angeles. I mean, my God, if anybody wants to sponsor a trip for me there, I'll be there in a heartbeat. But investors, at least the the vast majority of them from the ones we hear from, all qualify it that way, are on the East Coast. So we look at Miami as our flagship event. And then uh, right now, we're, we're pretty much sitting in Chicago for our fall event. So we'll do two a year. Eventually, it may end up as one, which would be Miami. Uh, but for now, it's the two events as we we highlight multiple markets throughout the throughout the U.S. and the East Coast. I want to go back to what you said prior about the size of the event because you're right; like it is large, but it feels so tiny and and small. And I, I never really understood how that felt until the first time I attended the event in Chicago last time. And Kellen was like. How's it like? And I was like, it is like networking on steroids. People are all in this <laughs> small hall and I'm being pulled and pushed and trying to grab this person. I was like, I, I don't know what to do. Like, I'm almost <laughs> overwhelmed because I can't be in all these places at once. And I, I hadn't felt that small, small, like community feeling in a while, especially some of these other kind of events that are so large, right? Like an MJ Biz, it is the two, two floors, the huge halls. You're walking for, for days. It feels like you're never going to run into people. But here, it feels like it's so easily done. You can find the people you're looking for. And the, the, the type of people there, are, it's everyone you want to talk to. All the people yeah. you're interested in, in learning about, the type of companies that you might not have had enough exposure to, the, the, the questions you want to ask them and learn about and get a direct response on are all there. And I give your team a ton of props for actually having an event where people show up at because yeah. I think it's probably harder said than done. That's been the ultimate goal is, you know, we, we do, of course, we want people to party, we want people to have fun, we want people to have an experience, right? Events are experiences at, at the yeah. end of the day. If you don't put on an experience that people remember, they're not going to come back. <laughs> like, why would they? But if, you know, if you're on Miami Beach, right, you're, you're at the Fountain Blue, you have a cabana meeting with Emily Paxia or, or Boris Jordan, right? I mean, that's an experience that... You, I mean, name me another event that that does that on the regular. There really isn't one. Right. And that's something that we pride ourselves in. And I think, you know, not to to disregard, you know, the, the value of who we are is the content, right? It is the education. And, you know, different events have different value props. And, and I think it's important to understand if I'm buying a ticket to an event, what is their audience? Like, what am I going there for? Uh, and and go in prepared because if I go to to MJ Biz, 
I'm probably going to have a different approach to that event than I will going to a Benzinga event. Even though you have pretty much a lot of the same service providers and vendors are there, a lot of the same MSOs are represented, albeit the C-suites are probably not on the floor unless they're speaking at MJ Biz. But you know, it's something where it's still a very different event approach, I think. With us, it's all it's the content. And I think that's our value. The education is our value. Uh, and we really take that to heart and make sure that the companies that are leading the industry, both from a corporate standpoint, a social equity standpoint, a financial standpoint, a vendor standpoint, those are the ones we have on stage. And then, of course, we want to challenge our brands to be represented as well. So we create room for them. Uh, and, and it's a balance, right? You have to have people that draw tickets to the event, that, that draw um, you know, other members of the cannabis space to the event. But you also want to be a partner to the industry at large mm-hmm. and create space uh, for, for the next upcoming wave of leaders in this industry. So when you guys are producing that content, is it like a collaborative effort between like the speakers that you're going to have on? Or is it kind of like, hey, we'd love for you to speak on this topic? How does that kind of get formed? We are very controlling. <laughs> uh, we, we are a bad date, uh, I'll say. But <laughs> it, in that sense, a lot of people, of course, you know, they speak at a lot of events, you know, they speak at a lot of smaller events and or even, you know, peer events to us. And they get to to build a panel. We're very different, you know. We 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 listen to our audience. We're very you know, finger on the pulse, you know, for better or worse. And you know, we will place every speaker on that agenda. And you know, there are some times when you can fault us for you know not having a diverse voice on that panel, or not having a a female voice on that panel. But uh, if you look at the evolution of our agendas, we're actively remedying that. Um, you know, and it's something that we want to make sure the content flows. We want to make sure it makes sense. We make sure there are actual discussions on stage and not just preachy, you know, agreements. <laughs> like, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Well, you know, let, but we want to make sure we want, to, we want people to actually like butt heads a little bit, you know, so that there's actual education happening. Um, so we want to make sure that we are very, very in control of the content where it goes and what people are listening to. I think that's an under underappreciated aspect of the type of details to go into it because it would be way easier just to select the speakers you know want to talk to each other, just let them all go. But you're right, the information then would be kind of like the same, and it's not like that. So, how, how does that work? Is there a role playing that goes involved? Is that like a deeper understanding of personalities and interests, and kind of knowing the individuals that are going to be presented? How do you do that mixture together? So <laughs> there, this is where my wonderful colleague and co-host Javier Hase comes in, <laughs> right? So we, we know all the major players already and major players being your, your MSOs, the people who drive large revenues in this space. Uh, they're generally always there. But understanding who is making waves, uh, what topics are people looking for? People want to talk about cost cutting right now. Right, you know, how is that going to be a theme at our April event? I'm, you got to come and find out. But <laughs> right, <laughs> Love that. right. Nice. But you know, it's it, that's the type of education we're going to have is is brand discussions. Right, we're we're actively hunting down large large brand representation that's not cannabis centric to come and talk about possible cannabis retail synergies. Well, once cannabis is legal, right? So we're we're looking to innovate our content every single event. And we're looking to make sure that we're touching on content that wants to be touched on, if that makes sense. Is there potential opportunity for expansion outside of the cannabis industry? Hypothetically, if alcohol or big tobacco are interested in kind of being a part of these conversations to get more of a nuanced talk of what the future could look like from multiple parties? Absolutely. We have already been in discussion uh, with them uh, to participate in these in, in these conversations. And um, some positive talks, some not positive talks, right? Some people want to be a part of it. Others want to keep it arm's length until everything is is legal in 50,000 years, right? <laughs> I mean, is what it seems, right? Yeah, right. But, you know, as, as for our events, I mean, we, we host events in multiple industries. So we're always talking to people outside of cannabis. And if, you know, a lot of our vendors will participate in our crypto event. You know, we have alternative investment sources as well, you know, like crowdfunding. Uh, you know, if you're a private company or crowdfunding, you're considering crowdfunding. Uh, that's something that we host a ton of content and actually virtual events in. So, I mean, there's always crossover there. 
how much crossover has there been from the psychedelic space with the cannabis space? Are you guys going to just segment those off and kind of run on your own psychedelic track and keep them separate? Or are you guys going to kind of let them still uh, overlap, if you will? Psychedelics for us is not, you know, want to say this without dissing the psychedelic space, but psychedelics doesn't have a big enough audience yet. It's not that we want to combine the industries. And, you know, you could look at Wonderland and completely disagree with me, right? Like there is an audience for events, absolutely. But we are a side, we are a sector of a psychedelics event, right? And, And how much money is flowing in that space right now? I mean, you had 2 billion and then it just dried up for R and D. And so, I mean, we will have hundreds of people come to our psychedelics track, but have a standalone event for that. Uh, it just hasn't seemed like the right time for us yet. Uh, but we will have a full day of psychedelics content in Miami on April 13th. A good deal of the cannabis audience will stay for that day. But you're looking at, you know, I, I spoke to a good partner of mine that's a lender. Uh, and you know he's interested in lending to both spaces. Obviously, he's active in cannabis, but is exploring psychedelics. Um, same with law firms, recruitment firms, you know, accounting firms. Those vendors are all wanting to work in both spaces. But when you have investors, it's more about education. It, it's more about is this something I want to dive into? I mean, it's more biotech, right? It's not you know it's not hospitality unless you're getting into a resort or clinic feel. In which case, okay, maybe that is something I want to, to look at. But you know we'll we'll have investment opportunities there. But again, this is such an early side of psychedelics and where it will end up being. It's highly focused on the education and content. Why do you think that psychedelics and cannabis have just been paired together like that? I think it's people willing. I think I think it's people with an open mind. Honestly, yeah. I, I think it's people that are already working in one emerging market that see, yeah, it's risky AF, but. You know, if I go into this other market, you know, that's actually maybe a little bit less risk. It's more biotech, right? But like if you're investing in Pfizer or, you know, a phase two, um, you know, clinical trial, like that, they're, they don't have a drug out yet. That is just as risky as investing in cannabis. I, I mean, that could go either way, you know, and, and every, you're, you're holding on every press release that biotech releases, you know, saying, Oh, the data's good. Oh, I'm going to buy 10 more shares or 100 more shares. Oh, the data's bad. Crap. And then the, you know, that's all they have to go on. And and psychedelics has been that way for a while, but now you're getting different sides, right? You're getting clinics. You're you're starting to get more wider acceptance to uh the the ketamine. You know, you're you're getting resorts, right? In in Latin America. It's becoming more interesting and maybe a little bit more connected to cannabis a little bit, but it's taking a medical pathway and it's unlikely that it will ever be recreational, at least from a lot of people we speak with. So connecting those two hip to hip, I think is a mistake, at least in the sense of content. However, the people who want to learn about both tend to be very similar. I think it's smart having it be the final day because you can get a sense of people staying and understand if it continues to grow, maybe it's worth having a, a separate track at a separate time and giving your team some got really good data insights onto the growth of the industry, specifically from the educational side, and if that's a good fit for Benzinga in the future. So slightly switching gears, one of the, the areas that I've heard about Benzinga Conference is that I'm not raising capital. There's no reason for me to go. What would you say to that? I would go back to who Benzinga is at, at our heart, right? And also, you know, I, I would look at your goals, right? Yeah, I mean, if you are looking for visibility, or thought leadership, if you're looking for brand recognition, if you're looking for uh, partners, you know, to, to help you audit your finances, you know, if you're looking for uh, equipment manufacturers, <laughs> or some sort of, you know, hydroponics firm, um, you know, if you're looking for debt, um, if you're, I mean, the list goes on. If you're looking for media outside of Benzinga, you know, screw Benzinga, you know, they're too big, right? But like, We'll have really cool podcasts there, like the dime, right? <laughs> you know, but like I, I mean, there are so many reasons to attend events. For us, I would, I would, our umbrella is B two B, and it's partnerships, networking, and, and yes, it is capital flow. But if you think that coming to an event is how you get capital, you're skipping a hundred steps, right? I, I mean, we 
offer a ton of networking. You can get media. You can meet people like Brian. You can meet people like Boris Jordan. You can meet uh, people like Ankur, the the CEO of C3 Industries, an up and coming um, MSO that's private in Michigan and in Oregon, in Missouri. Right? You can meet a ton of these cool kind of expansive retail operations uh, or wholesale distribution. I mean, we're going to have Leaf Trade there. Um, they've already committed. We'll have Kronos Group, uh, one of the largest LPs. So, I mean, if you're looking at international uh, opportunities, and you know, we're going to have a German panel, a Latin American panel, I, I'm I hope that's enough reasons <laughs> to co- at least consider coming, because you have to understand the event and what it is. And Benzinga, while we cover financial opportunities, not everybody there leaves with money. That's unrealistic and it's not the case. But people do leave with contacts. People do leave with partnerships. Um, I know one major M&A deal that absolutely started at our conference. Um, And I'm not going to say here because I will get in trouble with Jason. So believe me or don't believe me, but deals happen. Capital flows. You know, products move to different shelves at our events. Even you know, But it is a place where we are of the highest quality audience. And I will stick by that and go to the grave. It has nothing to do with our competitors. But I do not know of a higher quality audience in cannabis events. I I agree with you. And I think some of the conversations that we saw when we were there, Kellen and I were speculating, but it's fun to play that game of understanding like, hey, those two guys are talking. Maybe there's a potential partnership in the future. And then as you follow the the steps, you're like, probably has nothing to do with it. But in our mind, we're like, we saw it. We saw the origin of the initial conversation <laughs> go from there. So I want to stay with some of the media that happens there. Obviously, Mike Tyson has made tons of headlines with Benzinga. Ooh. At first, I thought maybe he was on the take and he was part of the marketing efforts. But then after a while, I think he's just a big fan of Benzinga and it gets excited <laughs> when he's coming there. So is that part of the team? What's the deal with Mike and always <laughs> making headlines with Benzinga? I'll tell you this. I, you know, we're, we, we love Chad Bronstein. We love Philo. I love his entrepreneurialism. Uh, and obviously, he has a direct uh, connect for us with Mike Tyson and Ric Flair. And of course, there's a lot of media that people get from coming to our conferences. We are, you know, if you ask a PR agency who has the highest impression count uh, for content coming out of, uh, you know, PR pitches, it, it's us by far, right? So, I mean, these people come to us for brand visibility as well. Um, it's not just us getting Mike Tyson and woohoo, but you know we we want a diverse perspective. And yeah, Mike has a questionable record, but I mean, people want to hear from him. People want to understand what's next. Why does he care so much about cannabis? What is up with those you know bitten ear gummies, dude? Is that really the best brand marketing play? I mean, have your opinions about it, but you're probably going to come and listen, right? Um, but that being said, it's not all about that. It's not all about, um, you know, just getting the the quick and snappy headlines. We, you know, want Al Harrington there who supports, you know, local Michigan businesses. We want Calvin Johnson uh, there. And then I'm spe- specifically speaking about celebrities, right? You know, but we want like, you know, we're, we're constantly having conversations with people like Rosario Dawson, uh, you know, with... with with differing personalities. We, of course, you know, open invitation, Martha Stewart, if you're listening to this podcast. Uh, I know, uh, you know, it's possible, right? She's a big fan um, of the dime. I'm saying <laughs> she, should, she should be. She should be, you know, but like, be real. Tommy Chong, um, we want all of them. It's not that, you know, we're, we're carving time on our stage specifically for Mike Tyson because uh, of one reason or another. We want every perspective. Um, that people want to hear from. And that is what Mike Tyson fits into. Uh, And he comes via connect out of somebody that I have a lot of respect for in Chad Bronstein and what he's built at Philo over the course of like two and a half years. I mean, it's incredible. Pretty wild. We we just released our episode with Chad and, and we're big fans of what they're building also. And the reason I ask is because we saw the headlines with the plane we saw him smoking on stage, which I still put best thing I've ever seen at a conference in my entire life. I've never seen anything like that in my entire life. Was there blowback from from that? I cannot claim that that was something we planned, nor it wasn't planned at all. But I cannot claim that we wanted that to happen. <laughs> uh, but that being said, there wasn't really a lot of blowback. Um, you know, I think I think it, you know, if it was anybody else, it wouldn't be any question. The cannabis industry would be like loving it, right? 
right. You know, barstool sports shared Ric Flair and Mike Tyson at our event smoking a joint together. Yeah, I'm right. Sorry. It looked awesome. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was awesome. I'll be they didn't give us credit, but whatever. That's bitterness, good. bitterness saved for later. For later. But that being said, like, I mean, Mike Tyson is is awesome. He's cool. He, you know, he he. A lot of people hate him, too, though. You know, it's something that we as conference organizers have to take into account, at least. But it doesn't mean that just because people are disliked doesn't mean we'll take them off our stage. Now, it does mean that, you know, we want to make sure that everybody's represented, everybody's voices are heard, and everybody has, you know, somebody there that they want to hear from. And we're making sure we give the voice to the right people. Um, But as we grow, you know, these people are part of that story. I think that's really important. And one of the areas that I think is is even more wilder is some of the quotes that Boris Jordan has made specifically about big tobacco. I was in this, the the audience that day when he made the comment about how he thinks the cannabis industry should become big tobacco. And I think people were surprised to hear that, but I appreciated the honesty in his opinion. Like, I recognize that he he's saying something that might go against the grain, but that's his opinion. That's how he sees things. And whether you like Boris or not, I think that's an informative stance from someone who's a, a big part of the industry going forward. So I guess from your standpoint, how quickly does your team recognize that a quote like that goes viral? Pretty quickly. Uh, we also get a call from the PR agencies pretty quickly too. <laughs> um, but I will say, I think for us, it was actually the beverage comment. Um, yeah, sure. And the MJ Biz was the tobacco one. But uh, the, Sorry, I mean, the beverage... No, it's fine. I mean, we're the same event. It's fine. Come on, man. We're all the same. <laughs> both, both times I've been shocked. Every time he speaks, I'm just like, oh my. I, you know, but like somebody that big, I mean... Yeah, it's PR, right? Yeah. Yeah, one hundred percent. I didn't even know he had a that. beverage company prior to that statement. Yeah, like it's it's fully PR. You know, it's you know, it, it makes it really hard on his PR team. But <laughs> yeah, I love it. I mean, he's more than welcome to continue doing that on my stage. I, I, like, I love it also. I think it's really yeah. incredible because you get you get something different and you get a piece of personality where it's not like a scripted response. He's saying something that his PR team may or may not be happy with that might have to do some damage control after, but at least you're getting a true, a true stance on something for a reason or not. And I'm pretty sure his, his standpoints are pretty well. And your tweets throughout the event are a great example, Brian, you know, you, you posted that and I, you know, the retention on that tweet, if I remember correctly, was ridiculous. It was insane. And it just kind of spiraled out of control. If we're going to be completely honest, because I was just like, Oh my God. (laughs) I mean, you you caught it. You, You posted it, man. You may have broken the news. Oh, we'll say it. We'll say it was right here on the dime. Yeah, you know? I mean, but but if we're just gonna be honest, like I, I think it's important that people hear those type of things because I was fortunate enough to be invited by your team down there, and hearing something like that is a staggering thing because mm-hmm. it goes against the grain. But it's the type of information that I think is is a little more contrarian, but also extremely valuable for people to hear as they recognize that the industry is wider and and more challenging than they recognize. Yeah, it, it's it's incredibly challenging, and I mean, it, it brings up. You know, the fact that people just innately dislike Boris for yeah. one reason or another. And it's, it's the same with Kim Rivers. You know, it's the same with Charlie Bactel. It's probably the same with George Ar- Ar- Arcos, although I, I don't really see the hate towards him, right. to be honest. Um, same with Ben Kovler. But it's just this innate dislike for, for that side of the industry. And I don't think that has much to do with what he said. I think you could have posted that, you know, he picked his wedgie walking off the stage. And it would have been a similar response. People will lose it. Yeah, this year, maybe I'll do uh, uh, another <laughs> quote, but this will be something like that. We'll see if it's the same sort of attraction. <laughs> what, about, what about the consumption? Tag him, please. Of- <laughs> Absolutely. There's no doubt about that. I'm going to have to edit that part out so people don't know it's coming. <laughs> what about the, the post-event networking? I know we chatted about the fact that there was no cannabis products. And obviously, I understand there's, there's limitations because you're not doing it at a Benzinga-based uh, hotel, you're doing at a public place. And you can't just be consuming products that ever you want without a consumption license. So are there hopes in the future to have more partnerships where we can have Benzinga event and have a consumption networking event like in a similarity? Is that a thought in the future? Yes, would be the answer to your question. Priority wise, I don't know where it sits on the list if I'm going to be quite transparent with you. You know, while I do think that anybody that is a CEO of a company and doesn't use their own product, I have questions about. I mean... If we're, if we're real, like it's why I, I, you know, when I started my podcast of Benzinga, I always asked, like, what, do you, what did you do before you worked for this company and led this company? And how has that played into your experience? And everybody has a different path, right? So I don't, you know, fault legacy operators as CEOs. I don't fault investment bankers as CEOs. 
But what I do think you should understand is the quality of your own product and be real with yourself about it. <laughs> and I mean, nobody's real public facing. It's all, it's all super high quality and better than everybody else's. But you know, it, for me, consumption has its place in this industry and in industry events. And that is what I'll say. But it is not the focus of our event. And you should not... I mean, if you're intoxicated while talking to this audience, we, we should probably chat. Because it's probably not a, a, a wise move for you. But you know, and, and it might this might get me blowback or heat or fire, but like, you know, this is these are people who can make you successful. You know, these are people who can take your business to a new level. You can take somebody else's business to a new level at this event. And that's the focus. And, and these after party networking, it's still networking. You know, it, it's it's meant to be fun. It's meant to everybody, you know, have loose, you know, be loose together you know, and, and have an experience, but it, it's still part of the event, right? So we cannot, you know, while, while yes, it is taboo, and I respect the fact that we have a bar at the event, right? That, that is something that we do have. And, you know, there, there should be an opportunity for you to consume cannabis and not drink alcohol, because that is a big thing for a lot of people. You know, I think one person very outward about it is Rosie Matteo. Yeah. You know, she stopped drinking and she smokes, right? So... With that, like, you know, I think there should we should have venues where we allow cannabis consumption. But that being said, it's something where A, we have to find the right venue. Uh, B, it has to be big enough. In consumption lounges, like, yeah, you can have a consumption lounge license, but how many people can you hold? And, and hotels don't have that license. We can't just whip out a joint and endorse that at a hotel. We'll we'll get we'll get shut down in a heartbeat by the fire marshal. So it, I mean it it's a difficult balance. And it's one that I respect if people want to be upset about. But it's, I don't foresee it being something that we can fix in the near future in the cities that we've chosen to have events in. And I don't think it needs to be fixed. I mean, if you think of like you're in Miami, it's going to be nice weather. Someone can just go outside, right? To a normal yeah. smoking section and make it even more destigmatized, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I can't endorse that. But like, I, I, <laughs> like, <laughs> I think it's important to clarify, right? It's not like your team is choosing not to. It's just no. not a path that's currently available. Given in the future time, maybe that's a consideration. And I think sometimes people just assume because it's cannabis and it's Benzinga, you know, they can do whatever they want. But it turns out your team also has to follow the rules and challenges. It, cannabis has stigmas. And listen, if you guys want a nightmare job, Try working with hotel vendors. Like I, I can't tell you how frustrating they are and how unresponsive they are, <laughs> like at large, because the Fountain Blue doesn't need to be responsive. No. It's the Fountain Blue, right? right? You know that's where the Rat Pack stayed. They're yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Do you know who we are, and you're like, yeah, I do. That exactly <laughs> yeah, it's like I, I, I want to know. Can I do this? Like, I want to know. Like, do you have this available? But you know, in in Miami, like, there's no opportunity for that consumption lounge right now. In Chicago, I would imagine there is, but maybe it's more of a private networking event. But then again, we still want to have that after hours reception, that after hours party, you know, and it, it's either alcohol or, or nothing for a lot of venues that we can find. Yeah. How does your team tell after the event that a certain topic, a certain speaker resonated really well with the audience to know to double down in those areas in the future? It, there's different ways, right? A is social. I mean, social retention. Right. I mean, love them or hate them. It's the fourth time I've said that on this podcast, but people want to hear from tier one MSOs. People want to criticize them. People want to be with them and partner with them, but people want to hear from them either way. It's the same way with politicians. It's the same way with lobbyists. It's the same with celebrities. When it comes to, to everybody else, it's obviously way more dependent on the topic, but you know, that's where our news desk comes into play. You know, we have our finger on the pulse in terms of what's happening in the industry like very few others. Uh, and it's where, you know, any earned content, it really, and we, we see the page views, we see the clicks, you know, we see what people are looking at. Uh, and that obviously is a huge uh, advantage. What is a fact or statistic that would surprise the industry about setting up a, a, a conference or an event? Benzinga is severely understaffed. That's more of a personal note. But uh, again, you'd think we're, we're as big as everybody else, but we're a team of like 10, wow. 10 to 12 people. Oh, wow. That put these events on. That's incredible. That is, yeah. So I mean, well, we obviously could grow, but you know, we're affected by everything, <laughs> as everybody else is. 
we actually were acquired in October of 2021. Um, you know, so everything we do is is very uh, intentional and very measured. So all that is, you know, in terms of what would shock people about Benzinga is it's it, it's a very close knit tight team that has figured out a process with the help of others, such as our um, acquirers at Behringer Capital. You know, but outside of that, putting on an event, you almost have to get really good at fibbing. I don't want to say lying, but it, you know, negotiations with vendors are it's a game. You know, it's a game, and you always have to play uh, on the edge. I will say, and that's not going to shock anybody. That's a, that's not as good of a good one, but um, it, it's 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 all under promise over deliver, you know, when you talk to companies, but when you're talking to vendors, it's, oh, no, we're only going to have 800 people, right? And then 2000 show up and you're like, well, it's fine, right? (laughs) You know, but regardless, you know, I don't think they're listening to this podcast, but it's, um, it's, it's a tough balance, you know, to, to walk between putting on an event and obviously running a business. And I think that is what people don't want to hear from me. Right now, but I will say is events are a business. And events cost a lot of money. And people want to participate at a free level consistently. And I respect that. I respect the knowledge that people bring uh, and the the presence, you know, the the effect of people's presences that they bring. But if we're not spending at least a million dollars on this event, you're not gonna have a good time. And you know, we have to make margin. Right? Or we can't do this in Chicago or ever again. So, you know, with that being said, I think people have this, you know, this kind of thought where this is cannabis. They should be offering this for free. You know, they should be doing this for free. But that's not reality. You know, we live in a capitalistic society. We have to pay for things. Uh, and, you know, running a business in events is a, is a high cost business. So that is, I guess, one thing that you know, a lot of people will kind of scoff at me at, you know, and probably not want to hear. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's the reality, unfortunately. And we, we do have social equity initiatives. We do have ways for people to attend for free and people to have access for free. Uh, we want to continue to have stage time for free. And of course, you know, not have people, you know, pay for everything at our events, right? You know, but everybody wants it for free in this industry, literally everybody. And a lot of people are disappointed (laughs) in my response, unfortunately. So it is what it is. It's honest. And I I appreciate you for being transparent about that because you're right. I'm sure a lot of people are hearing that are wondering why they can't get an exception. And um, it's just just the reality of it. And the transparency is probably the best part about it is because people can at least hear that and understand that it is what it is. It's not personal. It's business and decisions have to be made. Yeah. It really isn't personal. Like if I could give you all stage time and still come away with margin, believe me, uh, I'd be happy to. But alas, sad. my CEO would not be happy with me. <laughs> 20 years from now, we will look back and say, that was barbaric. I can't believe we did that in the cannabis industry. What is that? Yeah. I mean, you're talking just about literally everything in this industry. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's event centric. No. no. When you started your journey in the cannabis space, what did you get right? Most importantly, what did you get wrong? Cannabis is is people who wanted something new. You know, they they wanted a new journey. And for me, it's all about relationships. It's all about building value for people. You know, and I just got off something that basically was like, you got to pay me for value, right? But if you don't offer something in return, and you don't support people in return, then it's not a partnership. Right. And and that's the beauty of what Benzinga is, is we can offer visibility and earned media. We can offer, um, you know, awareness. And that's something that I love doing for my partners. And I wish I had done it sooner. Uh, You know, I think it would have been good sooner. But something that I realized early on was I can offer a lot of value to people uh, with with the power of Benzinga behind me and the power of our cannabis brand. Uh, and that's something that I feel has actually helped me succeed in growing my network and Benzinga's network in cannabis is taking what we do on an earned level and basically saying, I got you. Let me give you some visibility. Let me give you some awareness on this press release. Uh, and that's something that, you know, if you reach out to me, like I'm more than happy to do. 
uh, is, is help people out, get visibility, get awareness. You know, do, do an interview with me on the podcast. Like we do it twice a week. Uh, it's, it's a ton of time, but it's so much fun. Uh, and that's something that, you know, like if I can give you earned media, I will. I absolutely will. So that's something that I'm proud of, like that I think we're a good partner uh, to this space when it comes to visibility. Uh, one thing that I wished I had done sooner was get more involved and in, in be more of a partner to this industry earlier. Granted, I was still learning, right? I didn't really know what that meant uh, when I first, you know, during the first year, maybe even two years that I was at Benzinga, which I probably shouldn't have admitted that. But, you know, it's <laughs> for me, like, you can't be in this industry and understand what people want to talk about, hear about, what people need from you unless you are actively participating. And that's something I didn't do soon enough. Before we do predictions, we ask all of our guests, if you could sum up your experience in a main takeaway or lesson learned to pass on to the next generation, what would it be? And that, you should never, <laughs> never trust Washington, D.C. Um, <laughs> a lot of people should hear that. <laughs> uh, here's, uh, diversify. Uh, you know, we'll take it back to the financial side. And this isn't necessarily like for the next generation of Benzinga. This is for everybody that looks at cannabis as uh, an opportunity. Protect yourself. Don't give everything to this industry. You know, a lot of people have, and I am not discrediting them for it. I'm not disrespecting them for that. I, you know, a lot of people built this industry off their blood, sweat, and tears, and that should be respected. But when it comes to putting your money into this space, it's highly volatile uh, and protect yourself, whether you're starting a business or you know investing in one. So that would be my thought. You should always diversify, but there's a lot of people you know that I'm sure Brian, you see on Twitter, Kellen you see, or you see on Twitter is it's all in MSOs, right? And it just doesn't make sense. All right, prediction time. The April event is coming. Elliot, what topics or main takeaways do you predict will be the focus or the main idea for the conference? We're going to have a few different tracks here. So finance, operations, and brands are all going to be touched on. In finance, you're going to have a lot of people saying the same stuff, right? That they've been saying for a while. But it needs to be heard. But I think this year, you know, whether or not it's happening by the time we get to the conference, you're going to have people talking about receivership. You're going to have people talking about bankruptcy and seizing assets. But you're also going to be talking about the same thing of debt is the only thing that is flowing right now. You know, so I, I think that's a part of pretty much every conversation. But when, t when looking at maybe what the operators are talking about, it'll be cost cutting. So it's really about balance sheets, about how people are being flexible with their balance sheets, and about how much cash flow they, they have. I feel like that and how they build a cash flow positive business is going to be the through line of this year. And how to do it successfully is how we're going to, is what the content we're going to try and have for those operators. When it comes to operations, I mean, we'll have cool uh, topics like the hell is crypto going to be in, in payments for this industry? Is that still a thing, right? Um, you know, we'll have, you know, interesting uh, conversations with people like metric and, and headset, right? What, you know, data analytics and AI, right? We want innovations to be a centric part of this. And then brands, you know, there's been predictions. This is the year for brands. This is the prediction. The, the prediction where, you know, vertically integrated companies are seen as a little bit less valuable, and, and brands are seen as a little bit more. I don't see that from a capital flow perspective, but from a scalable business perspective, that is possible. So, you know, if this is the year for brands, you know, how do we get there, right? And, and how do brands participate in this industry at a more successful level and a more on par level as the as the vertically integrated operators? Kellen, you want to take a swing? Uh, what do I think is going to be the main topic or takeaway from Benzinga in April? Um, I'm going to go with a wild card here, honestly. <laughs> um, <laughs> my wild card is I think that the conversation is going to be how did how come New York took so long to go wreck and still not be a functional uh, market, right? Like they learned from California and all these other states that were... Uh, that did it before them. And then they still took all that time and they're still going to be a dumpster fire. <laughs> Whoa. That's the West Coast and him talking. Wow. Is it, Brian? <laughs> wow. I told you I was going to take a wild card swing. That's but I think that it's going to dominate a lot of the conversations because 
New York is going to be an epicenter for brands globally, right? Uh, it's just how New York City is in Manhattan, that whole vibe. And so they're going to see all of these finance individuals are going to see like, oh, wow, like New York was supposed to be this great industry, right? And they still are going to fumble the ball, in my opinion. And I think that's going to be a, a huge topic in the conversation in from a financial perspective, right? What do you think, Brian? You're first off, my prediction? First off <laughs> neither Kellen nor I have seen any of the agenda for Benzinga. Second, that feels like just a personal <laughs> shot is what you just took, right? Like, like it's like that has nothing to do with Benzinga. And you're like, no, we're we're really locking down this New York Kate. And second, it's not a dumpster fire, right? It's fair to call it different. And it's fair to say that they're doing things a little slower. Let's reserve that type of judgment for, let's say, six months from now. Then you can kind of say the mean things you'd like to say, and I'll likely agree. But until then, I'll reserve my judgment. Um, in my opinion, I, I'm going to kind of piggyback off what Elliot said. I think a lot of what you'll hear is operational efficiencies. And I think that's going to mean a lot of different things to different people. But from my thought process, what that means is that companies, instead of spending the money to grow at all costs, will start refining their operations, start adding in opportunities to really lock down those margins and understand how to make those margins. And I think one of the areas, in my opinion, that kind of got overlooked in the earlier days or in the last couple of years is it's just growth at all costs. And whatever the margin is after we produce the products is really what we want to do. And I think we have to really start locking in these numbers to have some sort of consistency. Because when you have really locked in numbers, you understand how to make better decisions. And when Mm. you do that, you can let go and jet send you know, bad assets, but also you can double down on the areas that are really working. And I think in my opinion, operational efficiencies will be a common, common theme. And it's just a matter of what it means to certain people. And I'm hoping that it means a lot of sensors. <laughs> Good content, <laughs> right, Brian? I mean, I'm excited, Elliot. So for our <laughs> listeners, they want to get in touch. They want to attend. Where can they find you? All right. So uh, uh, a few plugs, if you don't mind. What uh, bees bzcannabis.com. That's our event website. You can check out our past agendas. Um, you know, see who we've had there before. I think you'll see a really strong lineup. You, you can check out what we're doing so far in this one. The agenda for this one should be up in, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so keep an eye on that. But we do have cool companies like, as I said, Kronos Group. Um, we're going to have cool up and comers like uh, the CEOs of Groon. Um, it, you know, so it's it's a wide array of executives and participants in this industry. Benzinga.com slash cannabis for all of our cannabis news. Um, and then just hit Benzinga Cannabis Insider. Uh, it's our podcast. And we'd love to have you there. And then ideally, we get Brian and Kellen there uh, to you know, chat more about the dime and your all's perspective of the industry. But uh, that is you know where we talk to industry executives. So really, those three places are all you need to remember for us. Uh, and you know, we, we'd love to hear from everybody. So Elliot Lane, E-L-L-I-O-T-L-A-N-E at Benzinga.com. Always open for emails, always open to connect. You know, hopefully we can be a benefit to everybody from mom and pop shop in Oregon to multi-nation CBD play. I mean, anywhere in between, it doesn't matter to us. We want to work with you uh, if, you know, if it makes sense and if we can. Um, but, you know, we are not just some giant corporate shill. (laughs) You know, we we care about the industry at large and we want to give voice to everybody we can. Awesome. We'll link those up in the show notes. Thanks for taking the time. This was a lot of fun. This was a blast. Thank you guys for giving uh, giving me the time and the visibility on Benzinga. And hopefully we can have more of these conversations going forward. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Elliot.